The following video is a recording of a lecture from Genes to Galaxies, the 35th Professor Harry Messel International Science School, presented to high achieving Year 11 and 12 students from across Australia and 10 other countries. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Yes. Okay. Good. Well, you've all had an extremely busy two weeks, and I am the very last lecturer in a long sequence, so I'd like you all to sit back and relax, because I'm going to tell you a story. Hi. My name's Chris, and I'll be your proton for this afternoon. Um, so, in the beginning, there was me. Okay. So, there we are. We're going to start with the proton. Now, you've actually heard from several lecturers how we're not, in fact, starting at the very beginning. Um, we've, you, you, we, we've been hearing lots about the fact that there was a Big Bang, and for all sorts of reasons tied up with quantum foam and so on, we can't know what happens in the very uh, first 10 to the minus 43 seconds. And in fact, even this next bit, the bit where, um, where uh, subatomic particles and quarks and so on are dominating the universe, that's this region where general relativity and quantum mechanics are, you know, um, we, we really don't understand the physics of all of that. And if we did understand it, we'd be particle physicists. This is what the, um, the, the people at the Large Hadron Collider and so on are trying to elucidate. They're trying to understand the behaviour of particles at these very early eras. So we're going to start a mere... Sound on. Sorry? It, it, it is on. Do you want me to... Excuse me for a minute. How about that? Is that any better? Um, lapel mic. It's all the way up at the yeah. top. <laughs> okay. So we're going to start a mere one hundredth of a second after the Big Bang, which was the first time that um, the, the proton came into existence. That's where we meet our proton for the very first time. For a while, my existence is very transitory. Every time I meet an antiproton, we annihilate, converting our mass energy into a pair of energetic photons. These photons then spontaneously convert the energy back into mass, and we pop back into existence. There comes a time, however, when the universe has cooled just enough that the photons no longer have enough energy to produce new particles. When that happens, most of the particles and antiparticles annihilate each other one last time. I was one of the few, one of the very few, that did not find an antiparticle. We still don't understand why there was this tiny asymmetry, this tiny imbalance between particles and antiparticles. There was, and it was about one part in 30, bi 30 million, which means that for every 30 million antiparticles, there were something like 30 million and one particles. Okay? We don't know why there was this very slight um, imbalance. If there had not been, then every particle would have annihilated with its antiparticle, and the universe would be full of nothing but energy. So we're quite glad that there was this imbalance. Um, why exactly there was is a subject of much research. It's to do with some kind of symmetry breaking. But we'll, we're just, as I say, happy the fact that there was um, this very slight imbalance. And so this resu uh, the result of this was that one second after the Big Bang, the universe was essentially full only of matter and energy. The universe is a seething maelstrom. I smash into other protons and neutrons, but we're moving much too fast to stick together. The entire universe still consists entirely of subatomic, subatomic particles. As the temperature drops, I start moving more slowly. Now when I meet another particle, we can stick together. The strong nuclear force grabs us and binds us together into a nucleus. Around me, particles are sticking together in clumps. By the time the universe is a bit more than three minutes old, I am still free. But nearly, nearly all the neutrons have combined into nuclei. Okay, so as the universe cooled, uh, particles could start combining, but they could, could not combine in any possible configuration. It turns out that the de deuterium nucleus, for, uh, well, it's the deuterium nucleus is um, actually very delicate, and so you have to wait until the temperature drops sufficiently that th those two particles can actually bind together. Uh, almost immediately, every um, uh, pair of particles that makes it into a deuterium nucleus then meets another particle and converts into either helium-3 with three nucleons or helium-4 with four nucleons, but not a five-nucleon clump. Any time... Whoops. 
Oh. Um, Any time five nucleons come together, they immediately split apart again. The five nucleon clump is not stable. Okay, and that's really important. So, um, uh, what that means is that um, as, uh, about three minutes after the Big Bang, the temperature has dropped so low that these clumps can no longer be formed, and so we're left with a, a universe that consists almost entirely of hydrogen, about 90% hydrogen. The remaining 10% is mostly helium, and there are trace amounts of deuterium, and there's a tiny bit of lithium as well. But apart from that, there's nothing, and no more elements are going to be made in the universe for a very long time. Now, it's interesting that, in fact, the calculation of how much of each of these we get is surprisingly simple. It's just to do with the balance bet uh, between energy. It's really quite simple physics, and it turns out to depend only on this quantity called the baryon density. And so astronomers can measure the proportion of deuterium in the very oldest stars, and having measured it to this particular value, they've constrained the baryon density to, um, to quite high precision. So we know exactly what the conditions were like in the very early universe. Okay, so this, um, this era of nucleosynthesis ended when the, part when the temperature had dropped so that the, um, the, the particles can no longer stick together. That's because if they don't have enough kinetic energy, the electromagnetic repulsion stops two protons getting too, too close. They just sort of um, bounce off each other. And so um, that's where the universe um, is about three minutes after the Big Bang. It is still too hot for the electrons to combine with the nuclei to form atoms. So for ages, I bounce aimlessly in a sea of protons and helium nuclei, surrounded by photons and electrons. So we've formed all the nuclei of atoms, but we can't yet form intact atoms because it's too hot. Any time an electron tries to get trapped around a nucleus, it immediately gets ionised again. And so um, the universe is not a gas, it's a plasma. It's, it's full of um, nothing but charged particles. Um, this has one very important effect, which is that light cannot travel very far without bouncing off an, an electron. And when an electron bounce, uh, a light bounces off an electron, it gets scattered in a different direction. So the universe behaves very much like a fog. You can't see very far. Photons can't travel very far. And this lasts for um, a long time. And the temperature, the whole time, as the universe continues to expand, the temperature continues to drop. Nothing much happens for a very long time. But after about 300,000 years, the temperature has dropped to about 3,000 degrees. Finally, it is cool enough for me to capture an electron. Now I am no longer a free proton. I am the nucleus of a hydrogen atom. But the gas around me continues to cool, and as it cools, it fades. So this is what we heard about this morning as the surface of last scattering, right? Over on this side, when we've still got a plasma, the, the, the photons keep bouncing around and we can't see very far into it. As soon as the electrons get trapped into atoms, however, the photons can just travel in a straight line and, um, and have been travelling through the universe ever since. Now, those of you who know about um, tra transitions in electrons realise that, in fact, if particular um, energies of photons, you know, they can get absorbed by, by intact atoms, you know, like the, the uh, absorption lines of hydrogen, but that's a very small percentage of the electromagnetic spectrum. Most photons can now travel freely through the whole universe. And um, this was discovered and, and, in fact, is one of the best pieces of evidence for the Big Bang back in 1954, I think it was, by um, uh, Arno, uh, Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson. They were um, building very, very sensitive radio antennas and they found when they built their most sensitive one that, to their surprise, there was a source of noise they couldn't understand. They couldn't track it down. You know, they were really good at finding anything that was going to mess up their, me their, their measurements, and they could not track down this tiny, tiny source of noise that corresponded to a temperature of about three degrees. Um, they tried all sorts of things. Uh, very famously, Wilson describes how they, they found that there was a colony of pigeons nesting inside their horn antenna. And so they spent a while um, cleaning off what they described as a white dielectric material. In other words, <laughs> pigeon droppings. <laughs> uh, it turned out not to be the problem. And so they eventually concluded that there really was a, a source of noise, a source of uh, radio radiation coming from all over the sky at a temperature of three degrees. It was only after they'd made this, this announcement that they discovered that this was, in fact, a prediction of the Big Bang Theory, and so everyone was very happy, and they got the Nobel Prize for this in 1978. Um, you've seen this picture several times. This is the most recent, uh, recent picture of the cosmic microwave background. Um, and 
You can see lots of colours here, but that's because the, we've stretched the picture enormously. It's actually extremely uniform over that whole area. And the deviations from that constant 2.7 degrees are something like um, 0.0001 degrees, is the difference between the hottest spots and the coldest spots. So they're very tiny fluctuations in the temperature of the background radiation over the whole sky. And what th that's reflecting is very tiny density fluctuations in the, 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 the gas as it cooled and allowed the, um, the photons to escape way back um, at, at the era of recombination. Um, and, it's, and it's these tiny fluctuations, as we've heard several times, that are eventually going to grow into the major structure we see in the universe around us. Now the universe is completely dark. There are no stars. Nothing is hot enough to produce any visible radiation. There is no source of light anywhere. OK, we haven't talked about this yet, but as the universe cools, then the sort of peak in, in where most of the light is emitted is shifting further and further to the infrared. Now, you, you all know this is experience. If any of you have very old-fashioned electric stoves, the sort that heat up where the, um, the, the elements heat up very hot, you've probably noticed that you know, when, it's, when it's turned on very high and it's glowing orange, and then you turn it off and, the, and that glow starts shifting in colour. It goes red and then dark red, and then after a little while you can't see any optical light anymore, but you can certainly feel it if you put your hand on it by mistake, which is why old-fashioned electric stoves are um, not a good idea. Anyway, so there came a time where the temperature of the universe had shifted so far into the infrared that had we been there, we would have seen nothing. It's called the cosmic dark age for a very good reason. There was no source of light anywhere in the universe because there, was, there were no stars yet. Okay, so this um, dark age lasted for a very long time. The gas I am part of is moving aimlessly. But in some regions, the atoms are slightly closer together than other regions, so they pull the surrounding gas more, so they get denser still. Little by little, the universe is getting lumpier. So those tiny fluctuations in density that we talked about are now starting to form structure in the universe. What happens is that if one region is ever so much denser than a nearby region, then it has more mass, and so it has slightly higher gravity. And so that gravity then starts to pull more material in towards it, and so that process very quickly runs away. Things that start out a little bit denser ending up, end up getting much denser because the more material they pull in, the stronger their gravity gets. And so tiny de density fluctuations get amplified in this way um, so as to grow structure. And so wh um, what computer simulations, the, what Garant called the universe in a box, what they show is that you very quickly develop filaments and voids and all sorts of, of cool-looking stuff um, in, the, in the, the, the very early universe. And this is not just theoretical either. If we look at the pictures that um, observational astronomers make, um, taking redshifts and hence getting distances for hundreds of thousands of galaxies, um, this is a plot from the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey that was made at Coonabarabra about a decade, um, well, from a decade ago to more recently, each tiny little yellow dot in this picture is a single galaxy. And so this is measuring the distribution of mass on a very, very large scale. And just like the simulations, you can see that there are very dense spots, there are, there are filaments, and there are great empty voids that are almost completely empty of galaxies. And so the universe had um, developed this very lumpy structure because of the action of gravity on these tiny density fluctuations. But this whole time, of course, there are still no stars. There is still no light. All this is happening in the dark. For a long time, I drift. For millions of years, the drift is barely perceptible. But gradually, the gas around me gets denser, and it becomes apparent it is drifting in a particular direction. My gas cloud is now stretched out like a long thread. Then at last, something has changed. Millions of light years away, in the direction the cloud is drifting, there is a light. Far ahead, one of the first stars in the universe is shining. So this is the end of the Dark Age, the first time that, that uh, visible light has been around since the universe cooled below 3,000 degrees. So what's happened is that as the gas gets denser and denser, um, as I say, it's, a very, it's, it's very much a runaway process, and the very densest regions can eventually form themselves into stars. We'll talk a little bit more about how stars form in a bit, but for now, um, what we have are these very earliest stars in the universe. They would have been very different to the stars 
that we see around us today, mostly because they're formed out of primordial gas. They have no metals, as Charlie defined metals, nothing heavier than hydrogen and helium in them. Okay? So this has a couple of consequences. First of all, there, there cannot have been any planets at least no rocky ones, because there's no silicon, there's no carbon, there's no oxygen. So these stars would not have had planets around them. Um, calculations about the structure of these stars suggest that they could have been significantly more massive than stars that are formed today. The most massive stars today are about 150 times the mass of our sun. It turns out that if you try to make a star more massive than that, the very pressure from the light that it creates tears it apart. Um, in the, when you don't have any metals um, in the atmosphere of the star, you can, we, we think you can make stars up to maybe a thousand times the mass of our sun today, um, which means they were enormously bright and didn't last very long. We also think that when they exploded, they almost certainly collapsed directly to black holes, um, leaving behind black holes that were maybe a thousand times the mass of our sun. Um, yeah, so they, they probably did leave behind the, these, these black holes. The region towards which I am falling is now perceptibly a proto-galaxy. I swirl towards the centre where there is a massive black hole. All around me, other clumps of gas are also being pulled in. Some clumps are thrown completely out of the galaxy, doomed to disperse in the almost empty regions of intergalactic space. Other clumps get hurled towards the disk around the black hole where the gas will eventually disappear into the event horizon and be lost forever, or else be squirted at nearly the speed of light right out of the galaxy in twin jets. I avoid both of these fates. Instead, I find myself near the centre of a dense cloud, which gets denser as more gas collides with it and compresses it. So we know that um, supermassive black holes existed in the very earliest galaxies we can see. We know of quasars up to redshift six and a half or something, and, and quasars are the evidence of a supermassive black hole. So black holes existed from very, very early on in the universe. We don't know exactly where they came from. Some people um, speculate they might have been created in the Big Bang, but a more likely explanation is that they were uh, born from this very first generation of stars. So here's an artist's impression of a supermassive black hole, um, but we don't need to rely on artist impressions because we actually see these supermassive black holes when we look with X-ray and radio telescopes. So um, this is a much more nearby galaxy, not a distant one, but the, uh, the principle is the same. The optical galaxy is a very boring elliptical galaxy. It does have a nice pretty dust lane across the middle of it, but it doesn't look in any way um, unusual. But if you look at it with a radio telescope, what you see is these are these enormous jets that are being squirted out of the very centre of the galaxy and sort of terminating in these, um, these lobes that look for all the world like splashback. You know, if you um, are old enough to remember when you were allowed to, to hold hoses and you, ever, um, <laughs> and you ever squirted a hose at a wall, you know, everything splashes back on you. Well, that um, um, is apparently what's happening. You can see these jets in X-ray radiation as well, and so if you combine them all together in a colour picture, you get this beautiful picture of um, showing the um, existence of these supermassive black holes at the centres of, 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 this, of in, in this particular galaxy. However, evidence is growing that most and possibly all galaxies do have a massive black hole at their centre. We certainly have one at the centre of our Milky Way. And what's really interesting is that there's a very strong correlation between the size of the galaxy and the size of the black hole at its centre. If you're a big galaxy, you have a big black hole. If you're a small galaxy, you have a small black hole. Now, that might sound kind of obvious, but it's, it's interesting nonetheless. What it means is that, the, uh, that the, the black hole is intimately associated with the galaxy in which it resides. And which way does that causality go is a really interesting question. Does a big black hole grow a big galaxy around it? Or does a big galaxy you know, feed more stuff and grow a big black hole in, in its, in its um, inside? Or do they both sort of just grow together in parallel? It's, a, it's a, an extremely interesting question, but it does suggest that black holes are actually important in the way that galaxies evolve. Um, now, we do know that both black holes and galaxies grow by um, eating matter, in, particularly, in particular by collisions with other galaxies. Um, a collision with a galaxy can, throw, can feed gas uh, into the galaxy itself and also into the black hole. And so here's a rogues gallery, if you like, of cannibal galaxies. 
um, showing a whole series of pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope of galaxies that are eating one another. Um, in, in all of these cases, the, ga- the single galaxy that's left when this collision is finished is going to be bigger, and the black hole at its, its centre will almost certainly be bigger as well. And so probably um, this is how all these galaxies grow. And this is not a process that's finished. Geraint told you about the way that, that our galaxy is you know, devouring dwarf galaxies that are in our neighbourhood in space. Turns out that we're also still accreting what's basically primordial gas. We can see this uh, evidence of very low metallicity gas, in other words, gas that hasn't been part of another galaxy, still raining down onto our Milky Way. So this uh, evolution of galaxies isn't something that happened back then and has stopped. It's something that's going on all the time. It might have slowed down a bit, but it is definitely still happening. Over millions of years, the gas cloud around me gets denser and colder. Now I meet a friend, another hydrogen atom, and for the first time I find myself in a hydrogen molecule. (laughs) That's sweet. (laughs) Okay, so, um, uh, again, in the same way that that a nucleus can't grab onto an electron unless the temperature is low enough, the same is even more true if you're trying to form molecules. Molecules get ripped apart at lower temperatures than atoms get ripped apart, and so you have to get to quite cool temperatures before you can get the first molecules forming. And so that happens in the cores of these very dense, dark clouds of gas that we call giant molecular clouds because they've got molecules, right? Um, Now, if you're lucky enough to live in the Southern Hemisphere, and if you don't live in the Southern Hemisphere, you should go out and have a look at our glorious sky, but you can actually see some of these molecular clouds uh, in the Southern sky. For instance, here's one right next to the Southern Cross. If you look sort of just... Um, d- uh, down next to the Southern Cross, you can see a, a decided dark patch known as the Colsac Nebula. And that is a molecular cloud that will one day um, can collapse and form more stars. Uh, now, the, 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 the gas in these clouds is no longer the pristine gas from which the first stars originally collapsed because those first stars have exploded and, and, and um, sent some of their material back into the interstellar medium where it mixes with this gas. So by the time the second generation of stars began, the gas has been polluted with some of the heavier elements. And so um, things end up being a little bit different uh, the, the, the second time round. Now, the, um, you might ask, you know, why isn't this cloud collapsing now? You know, why, why is the Colsac Nebula still sitting there if clouds collapse? Well, something's resisting the collapse. And what that is, is gas pressure, right? If the cloud is, is too hot, then the, the motion of molecules within that cloud can actually, is, is strong enough to resist the um, fairly weak but insistent pull of gravity that's trying to make it um, come towards the centre. What this means is if you want to form, if you want to make a cloud collapse, you have to, um, you have to tip it over that edge. And the best way to do that is to make it cooler or make it denser. And so stars tend to form in the coldest, densest clouds. The gas around me has been growing and getting denser. Now as I feel the pull where one particular dense region region has started to collapse. As I begin my long fall, the gas around me heats up. But unfortunately, I go through a nasty divorce. My molecule breaks up, and then I lose custody of my child. My electron is ripped from me, and I'm all alone again. (laughs) When finally the collapse ends, I find myself near the centre of a young, massive star, about 25 times the mass of our sun. So again, this is being governed by gravity, right? Once the cloud has has tipped over that edge and starts to collapse, then the same thing happens that happened in the early universe. A runaway process starts happening because if if one part of the cloud gets just a tiny bit denser than its neighbour, then it has more mass. Its gravity is suddenly stronger, so it can pull even more in, which means it gets denser, which means it has more mass and its gravity gets stronger. So the, 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 um, the, the process very quickly runs away. Now, the older um, members of the audience will, um, I can describe this to them as the Reaganomics theory of of, um, trickle-down capitalism. Um, (laughs) In other words, the rich get richer. This is is how gravitational collapse um, goes on. I've I've also heard it described as the Matthew effect after a, um, a, 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 a... 
a line from the Bible where it says, um, to them that have shall more be given. Well, that's the way that star formation takes place, right? Uh, anything that en starts off just a little bit denser very quickly wins, and so a typical cloud of interstellar gas will often fragment into multiple stars, and we, um, um, which very quickly um, get denser and hotter. And so here's a picture of a young star-forming region where you can see quite clearly the very bright, very young, hot blue stars, and you can see the sort of tattered remains of the molecular cloud from which these stars were born. So, um, talking about what actually happens, okay, so we've got this cloud that's pulling, its, it's gravitational mass is pulling stuff in towards the centre, and that, of course, as it grows, it gets more and more mass, so the pull keeps on getting stronger and stronger. Um, in order to stop that collapse, you have to find something that's strong enough to resist that inward pull. What happens is that um, as the cloud collapses, it gets hotter, it heats up, the same way that a bicycle pump, if you, um, if you pump a bicycle pump um, um, and compress the gas within it, you can um, perceptibly feel it getting warm. Well, that happens on a much, much larger scale when you're collapsing a molecular cloud. And as the, temp as the temperature rises and rises, eventually you will reach the threshold where two protons or pro um, can actually, uh, instead of um, bouncing off each other, can actually combine to form deuterium. Okay? In exactly the same reaction we had back in the early universe. Now, I'm sorry, I should not have drawn that with a neutron. I only just noticed that for the very first time. What, what actually typically happens is you have two protons um, combining and in the actual fusion, fusion reaction, one of those protons gets turned into a neutron. Um, in any case, once you form deuterium, you can then fuse with two more protons and end up with helium. Okay? But only when the temperature has reached a high enough, um, a high enough temperature. It's about 10 million degrees. Okay? When that happens, it turns out that these reactions release energy which means that now, um, they, 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 they now can provide enough temperature and pressure to resist the collapse of the star. Okay, so we've had this, this in, enormous cloud of gas that's been collapsing and collapsing, but the collapse actually halts when we start fusing hydrogen into helium. And so a star turns out to be this beautifully balanced um, thing. It's, it's, it's in um, a very clever equilibrium because the, the, the self-gravity of the star is producing high temperature in its core, but that high temperature is allowing nuclear fusion to take place, and that nuclear fusion increases the temperature, which increases the pressure, which is then sufficient to balance gravity. Okay? What's more, it even has the right sort of um, uh, processes to balance things, because the rate of fusion depends rather sensitively on temperature. So if the star collapses a little bit too much, then the rate of fusion goes up even more, which means the star expands back outwards again. So it's, it's, it's a very clever balancing process. And that's how a star wins against gravity. Okay? That's how it holds itself up against gravity. However, the problem is that in order to keep this balance, you have to keep fusing hydrogen to helium. And that means you're using up a fuel. Okay? So you can't keep it up forever. Um, so. Um, by the time we get our young star, we have um, a, a large ball of gas, and down in the centre, in the region we call the core, is the, is the part of the star that's hot enough to be providing this fusion. The rest of the star has the same composition and everything as the core of the star, but is not hot enough. So you have fusion happening down here in the core, and the rest of the star is just sitting there, doing nothing. Now, it also turns out that... Um, how long you can keep doing this depends very sensitively on the mass of the star. Um, was it Geraint who described this as the James Dean? The stars are like James Dean, right? The bigger you are, the, 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 the shorter your life, right? Um, it turns out that, that the lifetimes of stars are very sensitive, um, has a very sensitive dependence on mass. If you increase the mass of your star by a factor of 10, you decrease its lifetime by a factor of 300. Okay, so a star like our sun is going to happily burn hydrogen in its core for about 10 billion years, whereas a star that's 25 times the mass of our sun is only going to live for about 600 million years. So that's a big difference. Okay? But the, um, and it's all to do with um, how fast um, you know, the, the stars are burning fuel uh, in their interior. I am not quite in the core of the star. Here, a bit less than a quarter of the way out from the core, the temperature is lower. I collide continually with other protons, but our positive charges repel each other. So we've got this, this star, 
And while it's in this phase, it's, we call it a main sequence star, right? And it can happily keep on doing what it's doing for as long as it has hydrogen in its core. But because the size of the core is finite, it's not going to last forever. For six and a half million years, nothing much has changed. Enormous quantities of radiation flood past me every second, produced in the core and flowing through the star to its surface, there to shine into space. Okay, so what happens when this process ends? Well, the star is depending on the extra temperature and pressure provided by, by the fusion in its core to maintain itself against gravity. When that stops, then gravity, which has been sitting in the wings the whole time, just waiting for this chance, takes over again, and the star begins to collapse once more. It's held off the collapse for six mi uh, 600 million years, but now it's, it's going to keep going again. So, um, so what happens is um, when the fusion turns off, then there's no longer any support in the inside of the star, so the whole star, but in particular the inside of it, start falling inwards. What happens then? Well, the temperature goes up for a start. You're doing more squeezing, so the temperature increases. So the very first thing that happens is that the star swells up enormously. It becomes a red giant star. Basically, the extra source of heat um, due to the collapse of the core vastly um, swells up the outer layers of the star. Our sun is going to become a red giant star in about five billion years, give or take a billion. Um, and when it does so, it will swell up past the orbit of Venus. And there's some debate in the community as to whether Earth will get swallowed as well or not. The last paper I read suggests that we'll probably just escape the, um, being swallowed by our sun, but it's not going to be a particularly pleasant day on Earth um, when the, the sun becomes a red giant. Uh, more massive stars, on the other hand, can become much more massive, sorry, much larger um, than that. Um, the, when a typical... Uh, 20, 20 solar mass star will swell up to as large as the orbit of Jupiter. And the very largest star we know of, uh, whose name is VV Cephei, um, has a, an, a, a radius or a diameter nearly as large as the orbit of Saturn. We know that because it's in a binary orbit, a 20 year binary orbit, and when its companion star goes behind the giant, it disappears for a whopping 1.2 years before it comes back out the other side. So these red giant stars can be very, very large indeed. However, in their core, um, the, the, the core of the star continues to collapse. Now, two things happen now. First of all, the area just outside the core is now hot enough to start fusing hydrogen to helium. It never took, took part of the fusion in, initially because it wasn't in the core, but now that the temperature has increased, we can have a shell of hydrogen burning outside the, 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 the dead core. Um, as the core continues to collapse, however, it keeps heating up, and eventually we reach the threshold where helium can start fusing. Okay, and we can have uh, helium nuclei fusing um, into uh, three helium nuclei to, uh, fusing together to form carbon. So this is happening right down in the core of the, the red giant star. At last, something changes. The pressure beneath me drops, and I start to fall inwards. The gas gets denser, the temperature rises, and the fall stops. But now it is hotter. Several times this collapse and halting happens, and each time the temperature increases. At last the day, comes, the day comes when, instead of bouncing off other protons, we collide and stick. I am now part of a deuterium nucleus, nucleus. Almost immediately, two more particles fuse, and I am part of a helium nucleus. Later, after more collapse of the core, this helium nucleus fuses with two others, and I find myself part of a carbon nucleus. OK, so this cycle can keep on going for as long as the star has fuel in its inside. So what happens is we start out with four hydrogen um, nuclei, protons, which um, then fuse to form helium. The helium uh, nuclei can fuse to form carbon. But eventually you run out of each of these fuels, right? Eventually you run out of helium in the core, and so you can no longer fuse to form carbon. So what happens, again, what happens is that the collapse begins again. The temperature goes up, and eventually you reach the threshold where carbon can start to fuse. And then the collapse is halted again for a while. And you burn all your carbon, you run out of that, and you start collapsing again. And so you get this continual cycle of fusion, running out of fuel, collapse, and so on. So what happens is, by the end of this cycle, you end up with a star that looks a bit like an onion, um, where you've got totally unburned hydrogen outside. Inside that is a layer where hydrogen has been fused to helium, 
Inside that is a layer where helium has been fused to carbon and so on, all the way down to the centre of the star, which, um, where the co whole core of the star is fusing silicon into iron. Now, you might ask, you know, why does this not keep on going forever? And it doesn't for the, for the simple reason that iron is the most stable nucleus. If you try to fuse iron with anything else, it actually costs you energy. Remember, we're depending on the energy released in each of these reactions to hold up the star. But once you reach iron, that process doesn't, doesn't work anymore. Okay? And so once the entire silicon core has turned into iron, that's the end of the road. And gravity, which has been waiting all this time, takes over again and the star collapses one more time. Now, the other problem with this is that the process accelerates. Uh, each successive step gets faster and faster. And there are two reasons for that. The first is that you actually get a little bit less energy each time. You get lots of energy from fusing hydrogen to helium. You get rather less fusing helium to carbon and so on. But the, um, more fundamentally, the problem is that if you start out with, say, 100 hydrogen atoms uh, in the core of your star, that leaves you with only 25 helium atoms because you had to use up four of them to create your helium. So you've only got a quarter of the amount of helium to fuse when you need that. And then you fuse three of those to form carbon, so all of a sudden you're down to only you know, 1 24th as much um, uh, carbon as, as you had hydrogen to start with. So you, you have less and less of each fuel and it, and it doesn't do you nearly as much good, so this process um, accelerates in an amazing way. Let me illustrate to you just how bad that, um, that acceleration is. Here's a lovely picture illustrating the, um, the uh, path taken by a star whose name was Sandalik minus 69 degrees 202. Not a very prepossessing name. However, it was about 18 times the mass of our sun, and it reached... The main sequence, it began its life on the main sequence about 11 million years ago. Okay? It lasted on the main sequence for 10 million years and a little bit. Okay? So it, it finished burning the hydrogen in its core about the time that Homo erectus was walking across the plains of Africa. Okay? It then um, uh, uh, started burn, burning helium about 50,000 years later. Um, that, that lasted until about 45,000 BC. That's when it ran out of helium in its core. Okay? It then burnt helium until about 10,000 BC, which is about the time humans were inventing agriculture. Uh, and then we have to go down here. So it kept on burning carbon for about 10,000 years, and we figure that it started burning neon in about 1971. Now, you know, this is, this is strange. You know, we're going from millions of years down to dates not quite in your lifetime, but certainly in mine. Okay, 1971, neon ignition took, part, took place. 1983, the star started burning oxygen. 1987, it started burning silicon. And then we know about this star because, sorry, in 1987, on the 13th of February, it started burning silicon. And we know about this star because 10 days later, on the 23rd of February, 1987, this star exploded as a supernova. This is the famous supernova 1987A, the closest supernova to us here on Earth um, since 1604, where Kepler saw a supernova in our own galaxy. Um, just as an illustration of what's going on down, down in the core of the star, what happens is that um, when the, iron, um, the fusion in the iron core stops, then the whole, there's nothing to hold up the outside layers of the star, and so they start falling inwards. The actual, the, in the iron core, there's, there's no longer enough pressure to hold them up, and so the protons and electrons actually get squeezed together um, uh, and turn into neutrons. And you're left with this tiny ball uh, composed almost entirely of neutrons. The iron core of the star has been turned into a neutron star. Now, this is actually dense and solid enough to resist the mighty pull of the star above it. And so what happens is, we might just, sorry, have a, um, one more look at that. Th th there's our neutron core down there. The, the falling in layers of the star fall onto this, this super hard, super dense uh, neutron core and effectively get bounced off it. Okay? There are actually a few details that uh, models, uh, the theoreticians who study this have a little bit of trouble making the explosion um, uh, get, get back out again. You basically get this giant traffic jam between this explosion that's trying to, 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 to um, explode outwards um, and the infalling material 
Um, the, the solution to that appears to have to do with neutrinos. But um, in any case, what happens is you end up with a blast wave that's ripping out through the star, through all those onion layers that had been built up while the star um, was evolving. And this, um, this exploding blast wave, which is moving at something like a tenth of the speed of light, literally tears the star apart. Okay? And when that blast wave reaches the surface of the star, it, it starts expanding into space as a giant fireball, and that's what we see as a supernova explosion. So here's the picture of um, supernova 1987A just before it exploded, and then um, after it exploded, it was visible as a naked eye object for at least a year after the explosion. What we were seeing was this giant exploding fireball um, visible to us as what looks like a new star. As I say, it's the nearest supernova we've had in 380 years. It's actually quite interesting. We expect something like one supernova every 50 years in our galaxy. And we haven't had one for 380, at least not that we've um, been able to see. It's quite ironic. The last two supernovae in our galaxy that we know of were both seen in the, the generation before the discovery of the telescope. <laughs> um, and we've been waiting ever since. So um, we're kind of overdue, and um, we're very much looking forward to when the next supernova explodes so that we can learn uh, much, much more about it. So in any case, um, this incandescent ball of gas that's exploding outwards, what, what remains of the star, um, reaches the size of Earth's orbit in less than a day. Okay? So, um, so that's the, the, the final fate of a star like the one we're talking about. I have no warning of the catastrophic events that have taken place deep below me in the core of the star. The first sign is that the pressure beneath me suddenly drops. The whole star begins to collapse. All the gas around me starts to fall <clears throat> inwards. A short time later, however, a blast wave roars past me and I am exploded outwards. All around me, nuclei are being bombarded by a flood of neutrons in the wake of the blast, forming new nuclei. Within seconds, elements up to uranium are formed in the crucible of a supernova explosion. I'm swept outwards as part of an expanding shell of gas. As the shell expands, it cools and after about 100,000 years stops glowing. The remnant of the star, now light years behind, is visible for a few million years as a pulsar. Then it too fades. The gas from the explosion, no longer discernible as a shell, mingles with the interstellar medium. Okay, so this picture is an X-ray image of um, a, a fairly spectacular supernova remnant called Cassiopeia A. Um, the, the age of it is about 300 years old. Um, it's possible it was seen by the then astronomer royal John Flamsteed in 1680, I think it was. Um, he, he noted a star on one of his star charts that nobody has ever seen um, before or since. So that may very well have been the supernova, but it must have been hidden from us by quite a lot of dust because it was certainly not very spectacular. In any case, X-ray telescopes and radio telescopes uh, see it as this glorious object and you can still see um, the, 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 the shell of the explosion. So it's about um, 10 light years across um, today, and it, the out, outside edge is still expanding at about 4,000 kilometres per second. Now, if you look at a, a, a supernova remnant that's rather, um, rather older, this is the Vela supernova remnant, which is about 11,000 years old, already you can barely see that it is a supernova remnant, right? It's, it's, it's starting to, to mingle with the, the interstellar medium, and you can, you can barely see that it used to be a shell. So it's at this stage that all the gas, which is in this expanding shell front, and remember, this gas came from deep inside the star. So it contains all those nuclei. It contains the helium and the carbon and the oxygen and so on um, that, that were fused uh, during the lifetime of the star. It actually also happens to contain even heavier elements that, that were made in the supernova explosion itself. But anyway, all that material gets deposited outwards and gradually mixes with the interstellar gas, which means that next time that interstellar gas collapses, it's been enriched. Eventually, I find myself in another cloud of cold, dense gas. Again, I feel myself drawn inwards to where the densest region is pulling in ever more material. Again, the temperature at the centre rises high enough that nuclear fusion begins and a star is born. But this time, I'm not in the dense centre of the cloud. By the time the new star begins to shine, I am trapped in an icy body at the outer edges of a giant disc uh, swirling around the star. <laughs> 
So as we know, not all the material that starts off around the star ends up in the star. For a start, some of it gets formed into planets, right? Um, in particular, we believe that our own solar system formed from that rotating disk of gas around where the very centre had um, coalesced to form the newborn star. Um, um, so, uh, and what's more, uh, so what happens is that in this disk of gas, um, particles uh, crash into each other and gradually coalesce to form the planets. Um, so, so the Earth and Jupiter and so on were all formed actually um, from gravitational pools and, and chemical pools inside that disk. But there's always leftover material at the edge of the solar system that never had a chance to coalesce into a planet. Now, as, as Charlie mentioned this morning, we actually see these disks around young stars. Here's a, 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 a selection of stars from the Orion Nebula, which is currently forming stars, and we actually see dark disks of gas and dust around these newborn stars. These are solar systems in the making. So, um, so th this is exactly the sort of process that eventually ends up forming uh, planets. Now, that, that debris disk, this uh, sort of ring left over outside the main solar system, we now have very strong evidence that of, of, of this disk in our own solar system. Uh, we now call it the Kuiper Belt, and we're discovering more and more objects orbiting outside the orbit of Neptune. And it was, of course, the discovery of this object, now known as Eris, that led to the demotion of Pluto because we had the problem that Eris turns out to be rather larger than Pluto. And so the decision was either we make Eris a planet or we demote Pluto. And so the decision was taken to, re to recognise that Pluto, like Eris and all these other new objects, are just the largest objects in this debris disk that's left over from the formation of the solar system. 600 million years after the sun turned on and the planets formed, something is happening in the endless cold at the edge of the solar system. The icy rock in which I am frozen is feeling new pools and, once it's, and its once stable orbit is perturbed. Some rocks nearby are flung outwards, but many others are hurled inwards towards the inner solar system. My rock is one of them. It hurtles towards, towards a small rocky world circled by one large moon. So one of the surprises of the space program was how important impact craters are through the whole solar system. And in fact, every single old surface in the solar system bears witness to uh, large amounts of bombardment. Basically, things crash into each other um, and have been doing so since the start of the solar system. And so here's a selection just of the body starting, some of the bodies starting with M, right? Uh, so Mercury has craters on it. T the tiny asteroid Matilda has a giant crater on it. The moon, of course, is completely covered by craters. And uh, my favourite um, is Saturn's moon Mimas, which has a, uh, a one very large crater on its side, which makes it look rather like the Death Star. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> uh, but craters are this really important part of the, whole sol of, of the solar system. Bombardment has been happening the whole time. Uh, things have been growing by crashing together. Now, again, this is not a process that has stopped you people have probably not been following the news, but there was great excitement on Tuesday this week um, because an Australian astronomer um, just outside Canberra announced that he had found a new dark spot near the south pole of Jupiter. And it looked absolutely identical to the, um, the, the impact scars left from when comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 crashed into Jupiter exactly 15 years ago. Now, you people, as I was just realising um, earlier, probably don't remember this, given that you're only 16 and 17 years old, but those of us who were there remember this very clearly, OK? The sight of a comet actually crashing into Jupiter in a whole string of lumps. That's planetary accretion, right? That's planetary bombardment happening even now today. So everyone's agreeing, um, you know, the, the NASA telescopes took pictures of this too. Yes, we're, we're seeing the scar left over from a comet crashing into Jupiter. So this process of bombardment is by no means finished, okay? It's going on at a much lower level than before, but it is still going on. However, what's interesting is, again, harking back to the Apollo um, astronauts who's, um, that we've been celebrating this week, the uh, rocks that the Apollo astronauts brought, brought back from the moon um, have tantalising evidence that about 600 million years after the formation of the solar system, there was this blip, this peak in the bombardment rate, 
It turns out that, that um, most of the rocks, sorry, most of the craters, that, um, the, the big craters near the sites where the Apollo astronauts visited all had ex- sh- uh, showed evidence for it being exactly the same age. And so the picture we're getting is that the rate of bombardment in the solar system dropped off in this beautiful smooth curve except for this um, suggestion that there was a, a brief increase about um, 3.9 billion years ago. Okay? Now, um, you know, this might have remained just a, uh, a um, how, how do you say it, a, uh, you know, curiosity, except that um, recent work has suggested that this, um, this peak in the bombardment rate might be related to the orbits of the, planet, of the outer planets going unstable. Okay, the suggestion is that, is that uh, Neptune and Saturn actually formed much closer to the, the centre of the solar system and then about 600 million years after their formation, their orbits went out unstable, they scattered outwards into the disk, this disk of icy particles that was orbiting around, and when that, ha- when that happened, those particles, some of them got flung outwards, but you know, a large number got flung inwards towards the inner solar system where they crashed into every terrestrial planet. We see the evidence of their crash on the moon because the moon hasn't weathered since then, but those rocks must have also pummeled the Earth okay, about 3.9 billion years ago. And because they were icy bodies from the outside of the, sol- uh, uh, outside of the solar system where ice is definitely a solid, they almost certainly brought large quantities of water to the surface of the Earth. The cataclysm of the impact that brought me to Earth has subsided. The icy rock has vaporised and mixed with the existing atmosphere. Sometime later, my carbon atom joins with two oxygen atoms to form carbon dioxide. Soon, I find myself dissolved in the newly formed oceans. Under the bombardment of ultraviolet radiation, I form many different molecules, methane, ammonia and simple amino acids. One day, I find myself in a completely new type of molecule, This molecule and its descendants will eventually transform the planet itself, changing its its atmosphere, its surface, and its oceans. It's a molecule that can reproduce itself. I, Proton, have made the next step in my long voyage from galaxies to genes. So, just before you finish, I want you to realise that that story is the story of every single carbon atom in every molecule in each one of you. Every one of them was formed just after the Big Bang, went, drifted in that long, endless dark, you know, eventually caught itself a, um, a, a, an electron and, and, and became an atom, had to be accreted into a star where it could be formed into carbon because it's only inside stars that carbon is formed. They then had to undergo a supernova explosion, be reseeded into another cloud and eventually collapse and be captured here on Earth so that you could be around. And so in a very real way, that's the story of each and every one of you. And so that's the sort of take-home message today, that you are the universe.